do I have companionship? Am I happy with it? You know, I think it's it's a, it's a it's a mix of all these factors. But definitely, if you've reached a stage where you're able to substitute companionship, and at that point of time, there's there's also the the ghee of passion on top. Uh, I think it's a no go. Yeah, that would be my take. Yes, and that's interesting because I was doing some research when I was uh, writing this book and research purely on the internet, nothing uh, <laughs> like empirical research. <laughs> And there's this uh, lady uh, called <laughs> Ellen Fisher who writes you know, books and she researches about this and she says uh, actually there are three different parts to the brain uh, and there are three different parts which govern romantic love, lust and long term attachment. Yeah. What's, it? I mean, what's the third one? I don't understand. Romantic love. Oh, that's, that's clear. Lust. Yes. Long term attachment which is stable, want family and you know, want to be with this person uh, for stability and bringing up the person. And apparently the three are, uh, the roots, the seat of the three emotions are different parts of the brain. Oh. So it's possible, theoretically, technically, uh, to have a long-term attachment, to feel momentary lust, and yeah. to yearn for uh, yet another person in a very romantic kind of a way. And, wow. Um, yes. So if you're very lucky, you get all three in one. <laughs> Or even two in one. Or even two. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. even happy yeah. with two, two in one. one. Yeah. Okay, we don't have to say which two. But yeah. yeah, two in one is two fine. Two in one is fine. Yeah. And I find that's that's interesting. That's probably why so many people, you know, look out because I have long term attachment, but I don't have two, or you know, it's yeah. very momentary, and, and I have this. I agree. That's a really interesting analysis because three out of three is a rare stroke of luck, but uh, two out of three is is good. Exactly. But one out of three, and it's gonna end in disaster. But then here's another question. <clears throat> research, uh, I mean, I'm just a research junkie. I'll just dig up some subject and Google it and keep researching it. And statistics reveal that traditional arranged marriages will last longer than love marriages. Why do you think that's the case? Yes, you know, that's very interesting because I also did uh, related research and I read a book uh, about, you know, the art of choosing. And it's very interesting and one of the reasons given for that is in an arranged marriage you already believe you don't have too much control over the choice of your partner I thought as much. and you are put into a relationship outside your control and you cannot exercise your own autonomy to get out of that relationship. You have to make it work as long as you want because you didn't have a choice about getting into it in the first place. Right. Whereas in a love marriage, you've exercised your choice, you've got used to exercising independent choice, so it, it's easier to exercise independent choice and get out of it. And uh, there is no, I guess, there is no rule which says love marriages will last longer, arranged marriages last longer, but one of the reasons why people stick it out longer... Because they're under family pressure, the families are married, exactly. you've never had the choice in the first place, so you don't have the choice to work out. Actually, you know, it's very interesting because that's my personal analysis of the situation mm. is exactly that. Here's my next question. Um, do you think there is there is such a thing as compromise in marriage? I mean, everybody talks about oh, marriage is a compromise, like it's a bad thing. What what is what is your take on that? So I think any relationship, and marriage is of course one of the key relationships, requires a certain amount of compromise. And the thing is, if you make that compromise out of choice, out of a willingness to say, I'm making this compromise willingly, I'm giving up certain things because it's good in the longer run for the longer relationship, that's fine. But if you're compromising with a lot of resentment and you're being forced to adjust So you're saying, I'm, I get beaten behind. every day. Should I compromise that? Okay, I can take, I can take one slap a day. So <laughs> it depends on what your what your yeah. threshold for compromise exactly. is, right? Exactly, and that's and different thresholds. And I was reading recently that a woman filed for divorce because her husband was leaving wet towels on the bed. This I can so true. relate to that. I can so relate to that. So I will not compromise on wet towels <laughs> because they wet the bed. They really do. And they don't understand it. And living in Bombay, you don't know what it's like. The bed will smell for like five months in a year. Yes. And so is it that or yes, you know, I can oh, slap. slap. Right, so but the thing is, yes, there are certain things you don't put up with because which I think uh, offends your own self-esteem and self-respect. You right. don't do that. Uh, you don't take it. It's bad for you as a person to pull along. But little things, wet towels, uh, coming home late without informing, uh, not doing your share of household chores, that you need to compromise and try to work out back way, a little bit back and forth because if you believe that the marriage is worth saving. Is worth saving. And 
Yeah, and that's a struggle Varun and Gayatri are going through because both are wondering, is it worth saving? At what point do you say it's not worth saving and get out? So I think the, the idea is to catch it early, like any any disease, any um, any ailment. It's always curable, treatable if you've caught it early. If you've left it t till too late, then uh, you know it's usually an operation that involves a degree of mutilation, and it's painful. And it's painful, yes. Everybody yes. involved and concerned. So the conversation, and the interesting thing is, so there are conversations between the husband and wife, and I was uh, looking at that from a detached third party, and I said, people are normally talking only like this. It's an early warning signal for you to do something about that conversation. Yeah, but clearly, I mean, from what from the conversation that they had about dropping um, uh, each other to work, yeah. oh, the driver dropping yes. and coming back. Um, I think that conversation is a dead giveaway something is wrong. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Yes. I would hear that somewhere and I would say, sit down and, and talk and it talk out and exactly. figure things out. Yes. And so, you know, a, daily, a dinner conversation uh, with the child, uh, what have you eaten, are you staying back? It's very transactional and that's right. what there is to it. And that's probably a warning, an early warning signal as to yeah. what kind of conversations do you have? You talk about anything more than chores and who has to pay the electricity bill and... I think that's, you know, I was having lunch with a girlfriend before I came here and we were discussing that how life has is always about call so and so up, he will come, pick yes. up a chair, give him this. It's become very transactional. It's become extremely um, task and work oriented. But here's the thing, I feel the two most um, wonderful things you can do with your spouse I just sit and talk about your day. Just sit and you know. I mean, I think for me the most fascinating thing uh, when I when I talk to my husband is about um, is is about talking and figuring out what his day was like. And I live it through him and ask questions that are pertinent. And then we talk about my day. And then I think that's like two hours of conversation. And listening, listening to the other person. Yes. Only not be on oh, the out of Blackberry or Blackberry. messaging somebody messaging else. Somebody else. <laughs> right. so that's yeah. that's not good. So I think the, uh, the last thing probably you know, which I wanted to check was you mentioned the girlfriend, right? So I think it's very important. Yes. So, um, so I'm going to read a little scene okay. where um, Sweetie has not been the kind who's had you know girlfriends like hang out with girls. Poor thing. Poor thing. Exactly. So she's getting a life now. So she's fairly conservative and she behaves like a good wife. So, um, so I'm going to page two. Yeah, two twelve. Yeah. And uh, Sweetie's now formed a new friend called Ambika. Ambika is a single uh, mother, divorced, very different from a Sweetie. So Ambika is convincing Sweetie and she's taken her out with two of her other friends. So it's a little girl's, uh, girl's night out. On Saturday night, huddled on a plump red leather sofa, amongst the chatter of a convival crowd and a live band with two young Manipuri girls crooning crowd-pleasing songs, Mildly tipsy after a tall potent glass of Long Island iced tea, Sweetie Singh listens to the chatter of the three other women who seem to have arrived from a different world. Kalyani and Saida had a patina of sophistication, an air of worldliness, a sense of being utterly themselves and above all others. Dressed in a pair of skinny jeans and a shiny black top, Sweetie had thought herself fashionable, but her prettiness seemed childish and pale before their bold stylishness. Kalyani said, I'm dying for a smoke. She was a woman of voluptuous proportions, clad in a tight, short red dress that accentuated her abundant breasts. She flaunted a tattoo of a red rose below her collarbone and a flourishing K with a heart on her right ankle.